Are you in John 12? Verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Verse 43, here's our text. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Lord, help us tonight, I pray, as we open the scriptures. I pray that you'd just speak to us tonight, please. Touch my voice, my throat. I'm tired. Voice is tired. <clears throat> I pray that you would help the word of God go forth in power and may God's people be edified. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I give you the, you can be seated. Unless you just want to stand, you can, amen. If I was Brother Samuel, I'd make you stand for about 30 minutes. While he was preaching, he used to do that all the time. He'd tell you to stand and he'd forget to let you sit down. And uh, we'd all see who, who, who could stand the longest. We'd all leave, give out, but we'd, we'd, we'd do it. But anyway, before I give you my title, I, I, was, I was trying to figure out what to title this message. And uh, I came up with so many, I had a hard time settling on one. I thought about this, when your fear overcomes your faith, be a good thought. Another one would be believing, but lacking boldness. Another one is when your comfort zone drowns out your common sense. What about faith without confession? Confession's important. In fact, I believe it's essential. Book of Romans, amen. But if we, anyway. When the pressure overcomes the principle, we got a lot of people today that knows what the principle is, but the pressure that is around them causes them not to stand up for the right principles. That's a pretty good title. What about believers badgered and bullied by the brethren? What about that one? What about this one? Seeing the light but full of fright. But I decided to just call the message what God called it. The praise of men versus the praise of God. And I'll tell you something right now. If you hadn't already made the decision which one you want the most, you're going to have to pretty soon. The Bible says in verse 43, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They loved it. They loved it when they were getting patted on the back. They loved it when they was getting that thumbs up emoji from the brethren. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? They loved it when they were part of the in crowd, which is why they was afraid they were going to be put out. They didn't want to be a part of the out crowd. You know, that starts young, that peer pressure. Starts young. Kids go to school, kindergarten, first grade, the pressure's on. Do right. Teacher's trying to give them, motivate them to do right. We've got that little demerit chart and all these little things that we do to try to, try to motivate them to do right. And there's always that one preacher's kid or deacon's kid in the class that's trying to pull everybody down. Oh, really? that's trying to get them to do the opposite of what they're supposed to do and then that's where the pressure begins. You don't grow out of that when you go through high school and college. I think I might have made the statement to my family yesterday or the day before yesterday. I don't even know what day of the week it is. I don't even know what month it is. I know the biggest waste of money I spent this year was buying a date book. That was worthless. The calendar back there, we should have saved that money. But I told my family, I said, I'm 47 years old. I'm preaching 27 years almost. I said, peer pressure is as strong now as it's ever been. Did I not say that to my family? That's what I said. Preacher, you mean you have to deal with peer pressure? We all do. We all do. But there'll have to come a day in every single one of our lives, we gotta decide which one we love the most. The praise of men or the praise of God. I've got three introductory points and then I'm gonna give you 
three main points tonight. Follow along with me, please. I don't want to spend too long tonight, but I want to give you what God gave me as I study these verses. If you're taking notes by way of introduction, we see the evidence was overwhelming in verse number 42. The Bible says that many believed on him. Now, I, took, I, I, I dealt with a lot of that this morning in this morning's message, but in case you didn't hear this morning's message, I want to just back up and just give you a couple things quickly. This is, this is what's happening in chapter 12 is bleeding over from chapter number 11 where, where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. We're talking about the evidence was overwhelming. Lazarus died. Remember, he was sick. He died. They wrapped him up in grave clothes and put him in the sepulcher. Put him in the tomb. Four days later, Jesus shows up. His sister was so offended, she wouldn't even walk out of the house to go and greet him. She said, if you had been here, my brother would not die. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. She says, I know that he'll be raised in the resurrection, but I'm talking about now. And the Bible says that Jesus walked out to the graveyard in chapter 11, verse 38, and the Bible says that he told them to take away the stone. They said he's been in the grave four days. He's, by now he stinketh. We've got a couple of those in our kids in our school. I believe he's been dead three or four days. You pass him in the hall. It's a joke. I know they're not dead. They just had not bathed in two or three weeks. I know. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth out of the tomb. We're talking about visible proof, okay? I don't, I'll be honest with you. I don't really know how much faith you have to have when you see something like that. I don't know how much faith it takes to believe that Jesus could be the son of God when you see a man that's been dead four days up walking around in chapter number 12. He's sitting at the table eating supper. I'm talking about the evidence was overwhelming. There was visible proof. You couldn't argue with it. The man was dead. Now he's alive. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty big deal to me. Not only was there visible proof, but there was in chapter 12, verse number 28, 29, and 30, there was audible proof. Jesus is right in the middle of speaking and he said, Father, glorify thy name, glorify thyself. Let me get it right. Glorify thy name, verse 28. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. People therefore that stood by when they heard it, they said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. They had visible proof. They had audible proof, a voice thundering from heaven. Now that's pretty, I don't know about you, but that would be pretty convincing to me. And yet, they still chose the praise of men. The evidence was overwhelming. Many times I catch myself in a situation and when I see the facts, take all the emotions out of it. Take all your preconceived ideas out of it. Take all your favoritism and take all your politics. Take all that, trim all that fat off and just give me the straight up facts. When I look at it sometimes, I cannot for life me figure out why it's so complicated for people to make a decision. Evidence is overwhelming. I mean, we can sit around and argue about it till the cows come home, but we get done argue about it, the, the facts still remain. The evidence in this story was overwhelming. Jesus was who he said he was. They had visible proof and audible proof. And you say, preacher, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say this, that verse number, verse number um, 43 had nothing to do with any question in their mind about what they were believing. They knew it. You know what bothers me almost worse than somebody that don't believe the truth is somebody that believes the truth, but they won't act on it. The evidence was overwhelming. Number two, the environment was overbearing. Write that down. The environment was over, overbearing. The Bible says in verse number 42, nevertheless among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. The environment that they found themselves in was not conducive to truth. Did you get that? The circle they found themselves running with, the synagogue that they were worshiping in, the crowd that they was with was so overbearing that truth and facts 
could not be a viable option. I went back this afternoon and just read a little bit of Matthew chapter number 23. I'm not going to do it tonight because I'll get distracted and I don't want to. But for 36 straight verses, Jesus ripped the faces off of the Pharisees because they were absolutely overbearing. He said, make, I'm not going to turn over there. I'm not going to turn over there. If I do, I'll get, I'll get distracted. He said, he said, you make rules for everybody else, but you don't do them for yourself. He said, you'll cross, you'll cross land and sea for one proselyte. He called them everything you could think of. Whited sepulchers. He called them graves full of dead men's bones. He called them vipers. He called them serpents. He called them hypocrites. The whole chapter. And that was the crowd that was in charge in this story that we're in. The Pharisees, he did not confess. These chief rulers would not confess because of the Pharisees, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Their comfort zone, their associations was more important to them than their relationship with God. Are y'all getting what I'm saying tonight? We got young people in our churches and our youth groups. They're more interested. They're more interested in what their friends think. And if that means that they have to stay cold and indifferent and not have any of the power and the presence and working of God in their life to maintain those relationships, then that's exactly what they will do. They will be on outs with God as long as they can be on ends with the crowd. Now let me tell you something right now. If your friends threaten to not be your friend because you believe God, you got the wrong friends. All right, you need to change friends. You'd be better off to go somewhere and be a Robinson Crusoe on an island somewhere all by yourself than to have a bunch of friends that will not allow you or put up with you believe in God. And we all know, every young person in here, every young person in here, every teenager in here, you know that God's right. You know that Bible's right. But it puts you at odds with somebody else. We got adults the same way. You'd go all out for God, but you'd lose your best friend. I'm going to say this as nicely as I know how. You need to dump them and go with God. Amen. I mean, these, these, these are chief rulers. These, we're not talking about we're, talking about, we're not talking about little no-names. We're not talking about the people that go to church and fly under the radar, the people that when they're not there, nobody seems to notice. We're talking about the chief rulers believed. But they had so much peer pressure from all the rest of the Pharisees that even with their position of influence, they didn't have enough guts and enough backbone to stand up and say, I'm going with God. I don't care what nobody else thinks. The environment was overbearing. Thirdly, write this down. The endorsement was overrated. Verse number 43, for they loved the praise of men. There ain't a person in here don't love the praise of men. There ain't a person in here don't, don't want to hear an attaboy every now and then. There ain't a man, there ain't a woman, there's not a teenager in here that doesn't want people to brag on them and commend them and compliment them and tell them they're doing a good job and I'm proud of you and, 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 you're, and you're doing great. None of it, there's not a one of us in here that doesn't like to hear that. But when you put that up against praise from God, the endorsement of man is overrated. And these people loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. In other words, they were, they, they were content to see God standing off to the side going, if they could get a thumbs up from their friends. They were okay with grieving the heart of God. They were okay with even rejecting, and that's exactly what Jesus went into in verse 44 and down. He talked about rejecting in verse number 48. They were prepared to reject God and the truth to keep from being rejected by their friends. And this is not some hypothetical message I'm preaching. This is real life. 
I could, I could just go up and down, I could go up and down the pews here and, 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 and give situations. Look at it, Sister Leah sitting right here in the middle. You're right in the bullseye area. November of last year, you knelt down right here and accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. We sat there probably for an hour and a half, close to two hours. And I didn't even know she wasn't saved. She came up here to look around, want to see the school. And I said, well, tell me about when you got saved. And she looked at me, she says, I'm not saved. And I have absolutely no, no idea what you're talking about. And she'd been coming to church for about four months. Sitting right over there smiling from ear to ear while I was ripping everybody's face off. She loved it. She had more joy as a lost person than a lot of people has been saved for 20 years. I thought she was saved because she was here every service. Even when she was running for office, she was here every night of revival. I thought, man, this, this, this woman right here, she's real. And so I said, tell me about when you got saved. And she said, I have no idea what it means to be saved. And I just looked at her and I just blinked. And she said, every single service you say, if you're not saved, if you're not sure you're saved, raise your hand. And I wanted to raise my hand, but I didn't. But I don't know what it means to be saved. Could you tell me? And I started in Judas chapter number one. Crisscrossed through the Bible for nearly two hours. She bowed her knees right there and got saved. Ask her sometime about what it feels like to be cast out of the quote unquote synagogue because you believe. Ask her. Don't ask her right now because she'll tell you and I'm preaching. <laughs> and I can just go up and down the aisles here. When you met Jesus, many of you had to make a decision. Am I going to go with God or am I going to go with my friends? Am I going to go with my family? That's another one. Family. Boy, the, I know blood's thicker than water. I've heard that my whole life. I don't, I don't know where that came from, but I know this. When I got saved, when I got saved, I got born again through the blood of Jesus Christ. You were talking about blood thicker than water. When I was born the first time, I was born by water. That's what he said about Nicodemus in John 3. He said you'd be born of the water and of the spirit. He wasn't talking about water baptism either. He was talking about the natural birth. So my natural birth was water. My second birth was blood. So blood is thicker than water. I'm going with my spiritual family. If I have to choose between my spiritual family or my kin, my blood, my family, I'm telling you right now, I'm going with God. Definitely when it comes to the quote-unquote brethren, the crowds we run with, one of the things that drives people up the wall is they try to stick me in a cubby hole, and I won't let them. They want to know what, what camp I'm with, what group are you with, what college did you go, what Bible college did you graduate from? I said, you ain't never heard of it. <laughs> what Bible college did you graduate from? You wouldn't know if I told you. Oh, tell me somebody that graduated from your Bible college. Just me and a couple other people. <laughs> the secret to graduating at the top of your class is have a small class. <laughs> they try to figure out where they can put me. And I don't fit. And it makes people nervous as all get out. Well, we don't know, we don't know what crowd you run with. I run with God. Who are you running with? Who cares what crowd I run with? Amen. My friends are all a bunch of mongrels and mutts. Amen. People don't even know my preacher friends. <laughs> These men of God that text me and call me and tell me they love me and praying for me. Nobody knows them. But God knows them. But from the time I was little all the way till now, there's not a day of my life that I don't have to make a decision, a conscious decision. Am I going to seek the praise of men? Or am I going to seek the praise of God? Because you can't, in many cases, have both. You're going to have to choose. Well, that was my introduction. Luke 6, 26, woe unto you when all men speak well of you. That's what Jesus said. Well, I just want everybody to speak well of me. Jesus said, you better watch that. 
I've hit the prime time. They made a caricature of me in the Baltimore Sun this morning. Anybody see that in the newspaper? A little short-haired preacher with glasses and a Bible standing behind a pulpit surrounded by a bunch of skeletons. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Boy, a lot of people, that would just ruin their day. I laughed my head off when I saw that. <laughs> I divorced myself from public opinion a long time ago. If I could give a flip about what people thought about me, I'd have quit years ago. Years ago. You're going to you, you're gonna have to make that decision. Many of you have. But in case you hadn't, you're going to have to before it's over with. All right, let's dive into this right quick. My voice is about gone. I, when my voice runs out, I just get my wife up here to finish it. She's the one that come, come up with all this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Write this down. Number one, let's look at the discrepancy of values. Seeking the praise of men versus the praise of God, you and I need to understand something, and it goes without saying that man and God has an opposing value system. You can't have the pleasure and the praise of man and the praise of God at the same time because men and God have two polar opposite concepts of what's important. So let me give you a couple of them just for example. Strength. Let's, just, let's talk about strength. Boy, everybody's impressed with strength. The stronger somebody is, that guy, there was a guy in the news last week that, uh, that, that deadlifted world, world uh, record. How many, how many pounds was it, Spencer? 1,100 and, 1,104 pounds. That's just a few more more than I did last week when I was working out. <laughs> 1,104 pounds he deadlifted from a squat. That hurts my back just thinking about it. Just seeing that video clip of him doing that, I was like, oh my goodness, I got to go to the chiropractor. That hurt. <laughs> got him all psyched up. His partner was in his face screaming, reached up and got his ears and just wrung his ears. And the guy was like, ah! and he just, oh, 1,104 pounds. He was like, whoa, 1,104 pounds. That's awesome. Man looks at the outside. 1 Samuel 16, 7. Lord said to Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature because I've refused him. <laughs> for the Lord seeth, not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. See, I'm looking for somebody that's strong, but not in their biceps, but down deep in their soul. I'm looking for somebody not that has strong physical stature, but somebody that's got some intestinal fortitude. In Psalms chapter 147, verse number 10 and 11, the Bible says, talking about God, he delighteth not in the strength of the horse, he taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. What's he talking about? The legs of a man, that's where his strength is. Back when I was on the world champion wrestling team, <laughs> you didn't have to laugh quite that loud. <laughs> I never wrestled a day in my life, but I know this, right in here, the legs, that's where your, that's where your strength is. Right there, that's that, your stance, that's how, you, that's how you fight right here. That's why God reached down and touched Jacob in the hollow of his thigh and he halted. Why? Because God wanted to weaken him where he'd have to lean on God. The Bible says, God delighteth not in, in the strength of the horse or taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him and those that hope in his mercy. Because it don't matter how much you can bench press or how many push-ups you can do, I'm going to tell you where real strength comes in in 2020, and that's when you fear God and you don't care who knows it. Amen. Amen. That's real strength. But see, I'm talking about the polar opposites here, the opposing value system. There's a discrepancy between what the world values and what God values. Strength. I'm all about you young men working out. Amen. Some of you need to eat more and work out. You look like chickens, flamingos walking around here. Get some meat on you, son. I, I'm all about that, working out. I'm all about the calluses. I'm all about the, about the strength. The Bible says the glory of a young man is his strength. But if you're hooked on pornography, you're weak. If you've got a lust problem, you're weak. 
If you don't ever pray or don't ever read your Bible and you don't want to go to church, I don't care. God don't care how strong you are physically. God's looking for people that's got intestinal strength. A lot of girls judge their boyfriend. I want that guy. He's a hunk. He's a hunk. Now, you better be careful what's at the top of your list. Amen. Strength. Write this one down. We're talking about substance. We're still on the discrepancy of the values. Substance. Boy, the world puts a lot of emphasis on what people have, don't they? Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You spend your whole life padding your pockets and trying to make money, trying to put up money in, in your bank accounts, and you spend so much time on money and assets and, and material things that you don't spend time with God and put things first that God puts first. The world will look at you and say, oh, they're successful. But God's got a different value system. Luke chapter 18, verse number 25. It's easier for a camel to go through the needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Not because rich men can't be saved, but because rich men many times put their riches before God. That rich young ruler came to Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He said, go sell everything you got and come follow me. And he's like, ah, I don't want to go to heaven that bad. I don't want eternal life that bad. Think about it a minute. I'd rather have a nice house a nice car and money in the bank and die and go to hell than give all that away and have everlasting life. That's in essence what he said. And that was the response Jesus said. The disciples were like, hey, go get him. Go chase him down. <clears throat> we, need his, we need his tithes and missions in, in the plate. Jesus said, I'm not chasing him down. Let him go. Hardly shall a rich man enter into the kingdom of God. Everybody's like, oh man, he's got money. Yeah, so? It's just money. Mark 8, 36, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying that if you're trying to please man, you're going to want to have all that nice stuff and that flashy stuff and that pretty stuff and that fancy stuff. And everybody's going to go, oh man, look at them. They're successful. Oh, he's got it going on. Ooh, look at that car. Look at that car. I remember when I got my first car, it was a little, a little Chevette. Hatchback Chevette. It's a step up from a Pontiac T-1000. Paid cash for it, $650. Riding around in this little four-door hatchback. And I had other guys that was buying sports cars and muscle cars, you know, and they're riding around doing donuts in the parking lot. Somebody asked me yesterday, can I do a donut in the parking lot? I said, go to Dunkin', do donuts over there. Says it on the sign, Dunkin' Donuts. Go over there and do donuts. <clears throat> My little car, it wouldn't do donuts. If I stomped on it, it would just cut off. <laughs> it wasn't a chick magnet, if you get what I'm saying. I sit at the red light. <laughs> light turned green. <laughs> But I had enough sense because I had people around me that loved me and cared about me to instill it into me. It don't matter what kind of car you drive. What's more important than that is having to walk with God and be able to get a prayer through to the third heaven and to read and study your Bible and learn the word of God. Put God first. I might have had a junky car, but I sit on the front row of the pew of the church and I hung on every word the preacher preached. I mean, on the edge of my seat like this. And the minute he said it's invitation time, I hit the altar. I wore the carpet out down there at that little spot at the light of Calvary Baptist Church. I bet people in that church thought I was a wicked, wicked young man. Well, I was. But I'm telling you how wicked I'd have been if I hadn't been in that altar every service. I said, Preacher, what are you saying? I'm just saying the world puts a price tag on nice stuff. 
And God's looking at your heart and your walk with him. And so if you're seeking the praise of men, they got a different value system than God does. Find out what's important to God and get, get God's applause and approval in your life that's more important than anything else. What about size? Boy, yeah, the world puts a big premium on size, don't they? Look how big it is. The little lad showed up with that lunch, five loaves and two fishes, and one of his disciples said, what are you going to do with that? Well, that ain't what he said. He said, what are they among so many? What a stinking attitude. I'd have fired that staff member. <laughs> little boy shows up with five loaves and two fishes. Here, I want to put this in the offering plate. The missionary came through here and God touched my heart and here's my two dollars. Two dollars? What am I supposed to do with two dollars? <laughs> Little as much when God's in it. Amen. Jesus said, move out of the way. Give me them five loaves and two fishes. Let me just pray just a second here. The Bible says he blessed it and he broke it and fed 5,000 people. They took up 12 baskets full of fragments. The, world, the world's like, what you going to do with that? What you going to do with that? I don't know, I'm going to give it to God and see what he does with it. Amen. The discrepancy of values. Number two, we see the definition of victorious. Oh, the world has a definition of victorious, don't they? Huh? The world's definition of victorious is coming in first. Coming in first. Boy, that, they got that checkered flag down there at the NASCAR. They love it when you get the first place. They, they start the whole football season out shooting for the Super Bowl. Do they not? They start the whole baseball season out talking about the World Series. It's all about that championship trophy. It's all about that, that grand finale. But see, God has a different definition of victory than the world. Because mine and your Christian life is not a competition. Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid it for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. God's definition of victory is way different than the world's. And what the world thinks make somebody a winner. To God, it could make them a loser or vice versa. 1 Corinthians 9, 25, every man that striveth for mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. What's he talking about? Well, they used to do those Olympics. They do all those games and when they get finished, they'd come up there to the winner circle and Caesar or whoever represented him would take a little laurel of leaves, little, little, little crown of leaves off a tree and put it on their head. You walk around looking like a potted plant. Ain't I something? Ain't I something? Look at there. I got leaves on my head. All that, all that work, all that dedication, all that commitment, all that training, all of that dieting, all that work. I got these leaves on my head. Paul said they strive for a corruptible crown, but we're striving for an incorruptible crown that fadeth not away. See, the world looks at us striving for an incorruptible crown and they think we're a bunch of losers. Now, if, we were, if your son was, you know, in the World Series, the baseball little children's version, I'm thinking of it, Little League, thank you, Little League World Series, and I love watching those kids play in the Little League World Series. It blows my mind how good those little kids are. That boy, that's my boy right there. That's my son right there. Woohoo! Hit that home run, hit that ball over that fence. That's my boy. But I wonder how many parents feel that way about their kids when they're out on bus ministry. Amen. I wonder how many parents feel that way when they see their kid go to the altar. That's my boy down there minding God. That's my daughter down there. God's speaking to her little heart, and she got up and went down there to make a commitment to God. That's my daughter down there. We've trained our kids many times to seek the wrong kind of crowns. Yeah. I wish to have the time to go over to Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 36 and down to verse number 39. But God gave an example of those, those, those heroes of the faith. They were stoned, cruel mocking, scourgings, bonds and imprisonment. 
They were stole, they were sown asunder, they were, they were slain with a sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goat skins, being destitute and afflicted and tormented, whom the world was not worthy. If you'd have bumped into them up in the mountains, they looked like a bunch of cavemen. They looked like cavemen walking around up there in the mountains eating roots and berries and and drinking out of the creek and they just had old animal skins wrapped around them because they had been pushed out of society. You know what God said about them? He said the world didn't deserve to have those people living on the same planet. Tell me God don't have a different definition of what it means to live victorious. Is everybody still with me? Let me give you the third point. We're talking about the praise of man versus the praise of God. Here's another one that God laid on my heart to share with you. The dividends of vulnerability. The dividends, the blessings, the benefits, the joys of living a life vulnerable and weak and dependent. See, the world hates vulnerability. They see somebody that's vulnerable and they make a, they make a target out of them, a prey. They're their prey. That's who they look for, the, to prey on, the con artist, insurance companies, and corporations and the, and, the, and the employers, they find who's weak and they exploit their weakness for their own gain. And even the evolutionists have pushed this, pushed this, pushed this, survival of the fittest. Only the strong will survive. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. But can I tell you something? God has a completely different perspective when it comes to being vulnerable. You know what God said? The more weak and frail and dependent you are, the better I like it. Can I back that up with Bible? Some of y'all looking at me kind of funny. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9, Paul said, after he asked God to remove that thorn three times, God said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, Paul said, would I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God said, you know who I'm going to enable? Those that can't do it by themselves. You know who I'm going to strengthen? The weak. And you know what I'm going to do? Because I want to strengthen you so bad, I'm going to give you a thorn that's going to weaken you that you can't get rid of, and then you'll be forced to look to me for power and strength. Amen. God has a different outlook on being weak and vulnerable. Amen. I look back over my life, and I've communicated this to my wife many times. I've communicated this to my staff many times. You think I'm transparent standing right here? You ought to be standing, sitting with me up there in that staff meeting when I just turn myself inside out and I get real. And they've seen me and they've heard me more times than I can count when I say I have no idea what I'm going to do. I can't do this. I can't do this. Say, so, preacher, does that scare you? Well, it used to. But now when I get like that, I realize it's going to be okay because God's going to step in and do it. <laughs> I'm serious. You think I'm joking? I ain't joking. Hey, we're all in this together. We all crossed the line last Sunday. We can't come back from. They ain't sticking cameras in my face because I'm that good looking. Maybe up front I try to be strong and give everybody some oomph. As soon as y'all all leave, I fall on the floor and cry. Because I need God more than I've ever needed him before. You're looking at a man that ain't scared of nothing or nobody. But my hands have been sweating for two straight weeks. I can't get them to quit. The world says, oh, we got them. God says, no, I got this. I got this. Stacy Shifley, he don't know what he's doing. That's okay. He knows he don't know what he's doing, and so he's asked me to do it for him. <sighs> First Corinthians 1, turn over there. First Corinthians chapter number 1. Watch this right here. Talking about the dividends of vulnerability. <clears throat> Look at 
Look at what he says in verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is of them that perish foolishness. I don't know how many times I've been asked in the last two weeks, what is the deal with y'all all having to go to church together? What's the deal with that? You know you can, you know you can live stream, don't you? You know you can, you can Zoom. Can you imagine going to church through Zoom? I've been doing these phone meetings with all these preachers, Zoom meetings. I'm doing another one this week, Brother Chad Conley, a phenomenal patriot. Asked me to do a Zoom meeting with him, four or five hundred pastors across America. I mean, it was Zoom meetings. It ain't like being in the room with four or five hundred people. I don't care what nobody says. When you got to take your phone and you got to do that for 20 minutes to see who's there, because there's only three or four people on the screen and you just do, y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? And you keep looking, oh, oh, yeah, and they're all sitting there. They're sitting there in the dark. They got, they're sitting in front of a window and it's all bright behind them. You can't see their face because they, they ain't got no sense to turn around and let the light shine in their face. <laughs> Come on, people. <clears throat> they're sitting there in their pajamas. They're sitting there. Their collar's all turned up. They're drinking their coffee and they're eating chips and smacking in the microphone. That ain't the same thing. And I told several people, I said, if your church experience is the same on live stream as it is in person, you're at the wrong church. I don't know how in any other way to say it. And I appreciate Sister Barley. Boy, she made a great point. These drive-by birthday parties are a far cry from a real birthday party where the kids get to get out and go in there and blow out the candles and play with their friends and eat the cake. Driving by and blowing the horn going, hey, that ain't a birthday party. Church sitting on the couch, watching a phone or a screen, that ain't church. They're like, I can't understand why you're not satisfied. We let you live stream. I said, you don't let me do nothing. We was already doing live stream. And I didn't never ask you for permission then, and I ain't asking for it now. We let you. We're going to allow you. We're going to permit you. I'm up to here with that garbage. We're going to let you. We're going to permit. You're permitted to. You're allowed to. The cross, the preaching of the cross is them that perish foolishness. We don't understand. We don't get it. No, we, we don't expect you to get it. I can't imagine why you would want to go to a lot of trouble to go to my family's family reunion because that ain't your family, but that's my family. Amen. I want to go to church. That's my father. This is my brothers and sisters in the Lord. I wouldn't expect you to understand. They think we're crazy. They think the way, everything we do is crazy. Paul said, but to this which are saved is the power of God. Where's the wise, verse 20? Where's the scribe? Where's the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? He goes on down in verse number 23, but we preach Christ crucified under the Jews, a stumbling block, and under the Greeks foolishness, but under them which are called both Jews and Greeks. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God because the foolishness of God's wiser than men and the weakness of God stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Where are you from, Brother Stacy? I'm from Waterloo, Georgia. That's where I was born and raised, Waterloo, Georgia. Waterloo. I can see y'all are real impressed by that. <laughs> Raised in a little single wide trailer on the side of the road in Waterloo. Not many mighty, not many wise, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world, verse 27, to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Y'all seeing this? And yea, things which are not to bring naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. I'm talking about the dividends of vulnerability. When you're weak and you're frail and you're feeble, God says, mm, yeah, I'll take him. Take him. 
Pick the runt of the litter. That's the one I'm going to adopt. I'm going to pick the one that's all gnarled up and don't nobody else want. I'm going to take that one. So when I do something with him, he won't be able to pat himself on the back. <laughs> I wish I had time to go over to chapter 2. Paul said, verse number 1, see I say that and then I go to it because it throws you off and you don't think I'm going to do it, but I'm doing it while you're thinking I'm not doing it. Chapter 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and to him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. People think about the Apostle Paul. Oh, what a great hero of the faith. The Apostle Paul was a nervous wreck. Is that not what your Bible says? This is Paul before he preaches. Everybody's out there, oh, I can't wait to hear the great apostle Paul. He's in the back room gulping water. But when he started preaching, son, God showed up. You want to know why? My speech and my trembling, my preaching was not with enticing word of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let me wrap this up. If you're seeking the praise of men, you're not going to get much being weak and vulnerable, crying a lot, and being dependent on God. You're not going to get a lot of a boys from the, from the world. But I'm going to tell you something. When God sees you like that, he comes to your rescue. And God will undergird you and strengthen you. And he'll do things with you you never thought possible. Because, see, God has a completely different set of, of rules for how things go. Amen. I wonder this evening, really, I wonder, which one do you love the most? The praise of men? If you had to choose between the praise of men or the praise of God, which one would you choose? Because you are choosing it every single day of your life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, altars open if you need to come.